Now here we're looking at an ordinary sinus rhythm. And it's called a sinus rhythm because it's generated in the sinoatrial node in the heart, in the right atrium. And we notice here that this monitor will count for us. So the rate is currently 71 beats per minute. And that's quite normal. A normal sinus rhythm. Now there's actually only three normal heart rhythms and they're all variations on this normal sinus rhythm. We call this a sinus rhythm because it's got a P, Q, R, S, T waves and the P, Q, R, S, T waves are in the right order and the rhythm is fairly regular. And it's a sinus rhythm because the rate is between 60 and 100 beats per minute. So if we wire you up to our electrocardiograph machine, this is what we would expect to see, a normal sinus rhythm. Now this patient's heart rate is slowing down. And uh, in fact, the machine's not very happy about it, so it's alarming. So I'm just going to pause the alarm because it's warning me that something's wrong, or at least potentially wrong. Now there's a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order, and it's fairly regular. But we can see now that the heart rate has dropped down to 37 and it's flashing because it tells us this is an unusual situation. So a sinus bradycardia. Brady means slow. It's still a sinus rhythm because it's generated in the atrioventricular node as we can see by the normal PQRST complex but the rate is less than 60. So a bradycardia has a rate less than, less than 60. So it's a sinus rhythm if it's 60 to 100. It's a bradycardia if it's less than 60. Now, there's a lot of causes for this. If you're fairly fit, you might have a bradycardia. To have a low resting heart rate is good. Some super athletes can have a heart rate of this and it'd be perfectly normal for them if they're athletically fit. And we often see the heart rate go down when people are asleep. And very often we notice it when people take beta blockers. But of course, there's also pathological causes. For example, this could be part of a vasovagal episode, or it could be a consequence of hypothyroidism where the metabolism is low. Now, the key thing here is to check the pulse and the blood pressure to see if the patient is symptomatic. Because some people can maintain a perfectly good blood pressure with this and they will be perfusing their tissues, whereas other people will be desperately ill. So if they're symptomatic with this, they could be dizzy, lightheaded, even syncope, falling over, feeling faint, losing consciousness. They could be short of breath. If they're active, they'll tire quickly with physical activity as well. If it's severe, there can be altered mental status and confusion. And some people, especially if they've got ischemic arteries, can have chest pain as the, as the myocardium could be hypoperfused if it's not generating adequate blood pressure. So always take the blood pressure, always feel the pulse. If the patient's not maintaining a blood pressure, if there's a cerebral hypoperfusion, not enough blood pressure going to their brains, then we would lie them head down to get the blood circulation going down to their brain. And of course, we'd treat the underlying cause. And sometimes we can treat this symptomatically by giving atropine, which is an anticholinergic, so it's a parasympathetic blocker. And we'll block the activity of the parasympathetic nervous system because it's the parasympathetic nervous system that slows the heart rate down and it's the sympathetic nervous system that speeds the heart rate up.
Now here we notice the machine's alarming again because it doesn't like this rhythm, it's far too fast. And we can actually see on the monitor that it counts it for us. This patient is now very tachycardic. They have a fast heart rate. So a tachycardia has got a PQRST. And I think you can see there's a PQRS and a T on this. It's all just a bit concertina together. It's all a bit close together because it's running fast. So a sinus tachycardia, PQRST, right order, fairly regular, but the rate is over 100. Now, there's many causes for this, but basically the heart rate is increased by sympathetic autonomic nervous system innovation. And this is normal, of course, in emergencies, exercise or excitement, the so-called three E's. And patients can have an increased heart rate when they come into hospital purely because of the anxiety. But it's good in some circumstances that the heart rate can increase because this can increase cardiac output. You see, it's a compensatory activity. Remember, cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped out by the heart per minute. And cardiac output is the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume the volume the heart is pumping out per contraction. So one way for the body to increase cardiac output is to increase the heart rate in a compensatory tachycardia. And this is what we get, for example, of a patient's hypovolemic, if they have low volume of blood, after hemorrhage or after diarrhea and vomiting or after burns, for example. And here the pulse often feels fast, weak and thready. But we can also see this in anemia, hypoxia, hyperthyroidism, where the metabolism of the body is uh, too fast. We can see this in compensated heart failure, myocardial dysfunction, such as ischemic heart disease, myocarditis. We see it in many conditions. The symptoms of this depend on the cause. That very often may, there may not be any, unless a patient was hypovolemic, for example, and not maintaining a blood pressure when they might be dizzy. And the treatment is to treat the underlying cause of the condition. Now, if you want to lower your heart rate, which is good physiologically speaking, then we need to get fitter because fitter people tend to have a lower heart rate. So we can exercise more, lose weight, manage stress, avoid alcohol and of course, don't smoke but I'm not sure you needed me to tell you that. So they're the only three normal heart rhythms. Sinus rhythm between 60 and 100, sinus bradycardia less than 60, sinus tachycardia greater than 100. And of course this sinus tachycardia would be perfectly normal if you were out running, for example. It depends on the situation and has to be interpreted as to whether it's a physiological tachycardia or it's symptomatic of some underlying pathophysiological derangement. So the rhythm we're looking at now is atrial fibrillation. The atrial myocardium is fibrillating, but we can see there's coordinated ventricular contraction in these QRSs. So we can see the fibrillation there on the isoelectric line, which is detecting the fibrillation of the atria. But impulses are getting through the sinoatrial node, causing contraction of the ventricles, which we see. But we notice that it's irregular. It's irregular in rate, and it's irregular in strength of contraction. So atrial fibrillation is sometimes called an irregular, irregular rhythm. It's irregularly irregular. You can get a slowish AF, so this is a fairly slow one. More commonly, AF is a bit faster, 
that this would be a faster atrial fibrillation. Now if this is acute in onset, we can actually treat this with the machine's alarming because it doesn't like the fast rate. If this is acute in onset, we can actually treat this by anaesthetizing the patient and defibrillating them. Because there is fibrillation there, it's just that it's atrial fibrillation and that can restore sinus rhythm. If it's more long-standing, we'll often choose to treat with medication. Now, at first glance, this rhythm may appear normal. There's a P, Q, R, S, T in the right order. But can you see the gap between the P and the Q, R, S is prolonged? And if that gap is more than five small squares, which is 0.2 seconds, we would call that a first degree heart block. So this patient's in a first degree heart block. So this patient's in sinus rhythm at the moment. Let's just keep an eye on it there. Now the patient's now gone into uh, ventricular fibrillation and in ventricular fibrillation there's fast, you know, the machine's alarming to tell me, that's good, I had noticed. So in ventricular fibrillation there's fast, chaotic, uncoordinated contraction of areas of the myocardium, different bits of the myocardium doing its own thing, it's twitching and quivering. And in this rhythm, there's no effective cardiac output. The blood pressure is going to be zero. Now, the causes of this can be ischemic heart disease, such as myocardial infarction, severe or congenital heart disease, electrolyte imbalance, rapid changes in the levels of potassium or calcium in the blood, for example. It could be electrocution, severe hypoxia, and we notice the rhythm's irregular with poorly formed wide QRS complexes. And I would certainly classify this as a coarse ventricular fibrillation. But because we're not treating it, it will become finer over time. We'll get a finer ventricular fibrillation. So now we can see it's becoming finer. It's not as, the amplitude is less than it was. And the finer ventricular fibrillation is harder to treat. So we can see it's much finer now. And the longer we don't treat this, the finer it will tend to become. The finer it is, the more difficult it is to respond to defibrillation. This version is quite a lot coarser now, so it should respond to defibrillation more readily. Patient, of course, in ventricular fibrillation is going to be very rapidly unconscious, 
no pulses, agonal or no respirations. As a first aid treatment, we would have to give CPR, but then the treatment for fibrillation is electrical defibrillation. Now this rhythm is a ventricular tachycardia, VT. Very rapid ventricular contraction, but with a degree of coordination. Now this is quite a severe ventricular tachycardia, and this patient will probably be unconscious. But in some ventricular tachycardias, the patient can remain conscious for periods of time, indeed hours although they'll feel very unwell. And if we don't treat this condition, this ventricular tachycardia, it will become a ventricular fibrillation as the rhythm gets finer. And we have to treat this with defibrillation. It's one of the shockable rhythms. So there's only two shockable rhythms, there's ventricular fibrillation and this one, which is ventricular tachycardia. If the patient's not unconscious, we have to, of course, anaesthetize them prior to administering the shock. Now this patient is in asystolic cardiac arrest. There is no systolic contraction at all, the ventricles and indeed the atria are not moving and asystole, a means without. And of course this is the rhythm you would get with uh, anyone who was dead but if someone's gone into this rhythm recently we would try to, try to reverse it by inducing a shockable rhythm such as ventricular fibrillation. That's asystolic cardiac arrest. Now there's another type of cardiac arrest called pulseless electrical activity. And that's exactly what it says. There is no pulse, but there is still electrical activity going on in the heart. And the waveform of that electrical activity can vary quite a bit, but it could look something like this, like a, almost like a normal, in this case, sinus bradycardia. But the key thing is, there is no kinetic movement of the heart. So the depolarization of the ventricular and atrial myocardium is going on as normal, but the heart muscle is unable to respond to that. So we would need to try and correct the underlying causes of this. And indeed, that's true with any cardiac arrest. We need to try and correct the underlying causes. And this is where the five H's and the five T's come in as causes of cardiac arrest that we can use to prevent cardiac arrest, but we can also use it to try and revert a patient who's in cardiac arrest. And the five H's as causes of cardiac arrest are hypoxia, not enough oxygen getting to the myocardium, hypovolemia, not enough blood getting to the myocardium, hypothermia when the body temperature is too low, hypo or hyperkalemia both can cause cardiac arrest whether the potassium is too low or too high and the fifth H is hydrogen ions which of course is the cause of acidosis. So if there's more hydrogen ions the pH will be lower because the patient will be more acidotic. And then the five T's as causes of cardiac arrest. One is tension pneumothorax, where there's a buildup of pressure in the pleural space. Cardiac tamponade, T for tamponade, where there's increase in pressure within the pericardial sac, constricting the heart. T for toxins and potential drugs, of course. And then T for thrombosis, which can be pulmonary thrombosis. And T for thrombosis, which can be coronary thrombosis. So this shows the importance of not just looking at the monitor, 
but assessing the patient's overall condition and palpating central and as well as possibly peripheral pulses.